Hello. Bam 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 bam. Hello. And welcome to well, the sea power behind the ring of sto uh, ring of iron, nay stone. And this is Thursday, the first of July. And I have changed shirt from previous recordings on the day, so hopefully that makes me feel a little bit more awake. And this is an introduction, and it's basically what's going on, why this all happens, what what we're talking about, and also why I'm calling this Ring of Iron Nay Stone. So let me start off with this small salient detail. When I went through school, it was called the Ring of Stone. Now I'm not sure if that was my school teacher, because uh, we talked about it in primary school, or if that's what it was called about 20 years ago, before they decided to go with the Ring of Iron. Ring of Iron definitely sounds cooler, especially in the sort of Iron Throne, Game of Thrones era. But when I was growing up, it was always called the Ring of Stone because it was literally a series of stone castles. And I'm going to be talking about the sea power behind this. Now, here's the interesting thing. These are the castles which we tend to include in the Ring of Iron Stone. These are the castles in Wales. There are a lot of them. I haven't visited even all of these, let alone all of those. I love castles, but honestly, I don't spend as much time in castles as I would like. Also, what you have to realise is, honestly, the Ring of... whatever you want to call it, Edward I campaigns, are more about conquering Northern Wales than Southern Wales. Southern Wales, as we'll be getting into, is a different kettle of fish. And sometimes when they start calling these the Welsh, you know, they, they call these English invasions, and then you go, two thirds of Edward's army were Welsh. They just came from a different part of Wales. And sometimes you call them Welsh attacks, and you go, well, hang on, they have a lot of Norman descended troops from the local lords who have presumably by this point become Welsh then do we call them because at some points they're called the Norman invaders but when they decide they're gonna side with against the English king they become Welsh the point I'm trying to make is it's more complicated than as mo as most wars are in reality it's more complicated than what you see on the tin and whenever I'm talking about these things, remember to take some of the descriptions with a pinch of salt. Because when you go deeper than I can do in even a series of 30 minute, 20, 30 minute videos, you'll find some of them, uh, it becomes a very interesting mixture. So, which ones again? These ones. Now, they are built in three orders. You have the 1277 commence ones, which are the first ones. They're in red. Then someone comes up with a bright idea of let's take on Edward I again, because, you know, he's pr he proved so easy to take on the last time in 1282. And, yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, I understand freedom and all these things there are they're a lovely thing and it's, it, he is implementing English law in Wales at this point and there are reason reasonable reasons for agreement but they also attack on Easter so that causes problems and that leads to another generation of castles Denby Carnarvon Conwy and Harlech and later on there's more troubles which lead to Beaumaris 
Now, some of these castles are never fully complete. They're all completed to the point at which they're practical and operational as a castle. But not all of them are completed to the level at which we would call them... complete. Also, you're going to notice something again. Again, please note, these castles are all mostly about either controlling access to North Wales or are around North Wales. You also notice that they're kind of on the coast. Barling Bullith, which is the one furthest down here and we'll get to later and explain. It's still on a fairly large river, but yeah. It's built there to control access. So. What are the things I'm going to be looking into in these videos? For starters, don't expect me to be talking about long things about the fighting of the castles and their operation in terms of these this many arrows on this siege and this many arrows on that siege and that's the thing I, that's not what this is looking at this is an extrapolation of a lecture i give occasionally at university and occasionally present as a paper i haven't yet got it put into a conference so i probably will do it at some point someday which is that the castle, by its very nature, when it's used in these operations, is a tool of maritime power and sea power. In that these castles, and I'll be explaining this again, are built by laborers and in many cases supplies and materials brought in by sea power they are maintained by sea power they are kept supplied by sea power they mean uh, that means whenever you besiege one if you don't have sea power and you cannot control access to it and those besieged the government manages to sustain in time they can tend to resupply them rather quickly using sea power. Which means you can't take the castle by siege. You have to take the castle by engines, by attack. And remember, the whole thing with castles is more often than not, when they are taken, it is by siege. It is by whittling the defenders down. If you can reinforce, refresh with food and supplies, and all the other things they need, it makes a siege very much a case of, well, you're roughing it out there in the pouring rain with having to bring your own supplies in and in trouble, and we're in a nice, well, protected-ish castle, which is warm-ish. We have food, we have beds, we have water, we have protection, and yeah, this isn't going to go well for you. When they are taken, most of them are taken by attack. You overwhelm the garrison. Usually when various people have been stupid in organizing their garrisons. The thing is, why am I saying these are a tool of maritime power and sea power? Because the decisive advantage Edward enjoys over the Welsh is the sea power, is the advantage of the sink ports and various other facilities which give him naval strength. Which means he can move and maneuver forces around easily. The trouble is sustaining those forces once they're ashore. If they do not have a secure logistics base, then that sea power has no ability to reach into land because you don't have a carrier, you don't have missiles, you don't have helicopters, and any things these days we use. And really, sea power has not got to the point at which it's going to be loitering offshore. So, 
castles as an expression of maritime power. <laughs> I am going to get crucified by some people over this, but it's it's an it's an argument I make, and I it's a as I said, I've turned it into a series of videos, and I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it sparks some debate and discussion. So let's see, what is a castle? Well, always an interesting debate. And I have got Bodium Castle up here because there is a debate about that and I've discussed it elsewhere in one of the videos about uh, of book reviews. So please note, if you want to have the debate about whether Bodium Castle is a proper castle or not, wait till the book review of a specific book about castles comes out in a one or two books to review. I think it's mm, probably when this goes out, it's going to be a, a few days away. So, technical. A castle is a type of fortified structure built during the Middle Ages, predominantly by nobility or royalty and by military orders. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Complicated. Um, well... A palace might not necessarily be a castle, but a castle can be a palace. I.e. Windsor Castle, the Tower of London. Also, a fortress is not always a castle, because it might not be a residence. And some castles are actually more sort of fortresses built beside towns as part of the town's defences. And as a way, as a basically a guarded place for the town's armory. And well, that then becomes complicated because well, the ones we're looking at in this series are primarily built for war. They have residences, but they are a function for their uh, their operation rather than the nature of being a personal car, a, a personal home. So. How do I put this politely? The question often becomes, are these castles, which we're going to be looking at today, fortresses or castles? I'm going with castles. Mainly because it's prettier, but also because, despite my love of occasionally winding up colleagues, Especially medieval historians, because they are very passionate and uh, people, and I have, I often love that when working with them, if they ever have anything less than free opinions about any given topic, of which at least all three will either be mutually con uh, mutually exclusive or contradictory, it's unusual. They are some of the deepest thinkers in the history field, and they do some great work. But they are also some of the most fun to have an argument with because they will end up arguing against themselves and you'll just be able to sit back and watch it. The medieval historians who I know know who I'm talking about and know which ones are you. All of you. <laughs> so, why was Edward I building castles in Wales? Well, this is how Wales is in 1267. Okay? after the Treaty of Montgomery. You'll notice there are marcher lords down south. The whole area of the Wirral is its own special area. For those of you who don't know what the Wirral is, the Wirral is that bit of yellow and chest, uh, yellow up there, which is basically uh, the Wirral and the Ch and Chester sort of area. It's not Liverpool, but it's often forgotten on maps. The amount of maps which basically go Wales, Liverpool, and forget that there's this sort of peninsula in the middle which is full of very interesting, lovely people. Then you have Gwynedd, which is the biggest kingdom in Wales, and often referred to as the Prince of Wales, is the ruler of that. Uh, you have various allied lordships, which are theoretically at this point allied with the Prince of Wales. Then you have in purple the lordship of the Princes and Welsh Kingdoms, which are allied with the sort of the King of England, and then you have the Marcher Lordships down south. 
who are Norman. These are Norman Conquest era lordships. Norm, uh, not, uh, basically, Norman lords have moved in. However, 1284, after with this sort of period, you'll notice that now the March lordships have dramatically expanded. Gwened has been split into three sort of areas. And the blue states are now allied with the King of England. And the County Palatine of Chester is in creation. It's a special area. Now, what can I say about all this? Those various names you've got down there, Lincoln, Warren, Fitzalan, Corbett, Mortimer, Bohun, Clare, Gifford, Lancaster, Marshall, Poole, are the various lords who have areas in there under control. They are powerful. They are ruling the area now. So the question is, where did it go so wrong for the Welsh? Well, it went wrong for the Welsh before this. Long before this. But we'll be getting into that as we go on to Edward I a bit. Okay. Why build the castles of the coast? Because it's simple. It's again, here's the classic example. It, the amount of, you know, I get this front and people go, it's something new and revolutionary Edward was doing. He liked to supply his castles by the same. I'm going to go, go to London. Yeah. There's a very large object sitting on the seaward side of Westminster and London, you know, up, up towards the sort of the estuary area. It's a huge, great big fortress. We call it the Tower of London. Why was it built there? Why not on a hill further away from the river, a more obviously fortified, fortifiable position, or not built upstream, more easily defended from foreign invaders? Because it's built to control London. It's built as the centre of royal power to show the strength of the monarch in London. But it's also built in a place which means if London does become problematic, it can still be resupplied. You can get an army into it. So, you have ease of movement of people and material. I'm not sure why I have easy there rather than ease. I think I was probably putting easy movement of people of material, uh, movement of people and material, and forgot undecided and turned to change ease. Ah well, maintenance. There's a logistical security, supply security, and operation. Easy route for relieving forces. Control of the coast allows economic control of the interior, and potential operation options to resupply under siege. All these things matter. Castles are, after all, about control. That's not a massively con complicated concept. That's what they give you. They give you control. They give you the power to influence events going around them. They're the ultimate visible deterrence. Look. Yes, you might outnumber us, but... Can you outnumber us and outmass us in enough force quickly enough to overtake this castle so that the supply of the reinforcements can't turn up and then outnumber you? That is the question. That is what they are built to ask. The garrison might be small. They might be just enough to maintain order and collect taxes in the local area. That is often the case. But, are they so small, and this is a finite judgment, that you can quickly overrun them? If they're not that small, 
If any attack is going to result in a siege, which is going to last for a length of time, i.e. if it's a siege, it's going to be longer than a week normally. That's pretty much a very quick attack a week in the medieval ages. We're talking months here. If a siege managed to go on for 60 days, 120 days, 180 days, reinforcements are probably going to turn up. Someone is going to send some troops. Either the lord who's responsible for the castle in various forms. It might be constable, might be the bailiff, might the various uh, various titles. Or, in your worst scenario, the king will organise an army and the army will show up. And they'll probably have a very nice water gate, which the army will come up in the river and get into. And then you have a problem. Because either the army goes into the castle, reinforces it, brings it all new supplies, kind of like Siege of Gibraltar scenario, and you're still running out. Or they come in, bring supplies, and then they sally from the castle to raid you. Or your worst case scenario, it's a large enough army that they start off by reinforcing the castle. And once that's putting down enough covering fire and got enough archers in it, they start landing troops and supplies outside the castle because they haven't got enough space inside the castle for them. And you're facing a fully fledged army in the field with tired troops who've been besieging for, uh, for months on end and have been suffering disease. Yeah, that's the point at which you either execute a rapid withdrawal or you request negotiation. So, I'm recording this before various things have come in, i.e. the ideas, for the, the vote results for Patron 28 and 29. But I can tell you, on the 13th of July, the Long Patrol is going to be on Robert Calder. Interesting gentleman. 20th of July... I have a plan for that, but I haven't put it in yet. And I'm going to be working on the rest whilst I'm away. Because at the moment, as you know, these videos are coming up because I'm away. Look at even more castles. Fun times. Right. Take care. Thank you. And hope you've enjoyed part one of 14.